uh, Bob Patton up to the stage after I say some nice things about him. Now, he's been the CEO of MSA since its inception way back in 2004. And before that, he was the CEO of the Manufacturing Industry Training Advisory Board. And he comes from um, 20 years in TAFE, New South Wales. And Bob, I still haven't got around to learning a welding course. I really do want to learn my welding course. Uh, never, too never too late to have a happy childhood, his exact words. So he came from 20 years in TAFE as a teacher and administrator and began his career in the fast world of motor and racing mechanics. Now, so, of course, Bob, you would know which is the only Formula One person who was both a driver and a manufacturer, and that would be... Sir Jack Brabham, of course, Black Jack. Now, he's passionate about making sure that manufacturing doesn't miss out on the smart young people who are our children and grandchildren. Some of them have, as their highest mechanical skill, the ability to charge their uh, smart device. They can't change a tyre. They don't know how to use a screwdriver. They don't even know that you can sharpen a screwdriver. Their highest skill is sharpening something, and this is something we have to change, is charging something, we have to change it. So his hope is that for today, we'll take a step closer to building an exciting industry in the future that will bring these guys in, and it'll give their, their passions and their ambitions and their dreams and their imagination a place to saw. A big welcome for Bob Patton. Look, I want to welcome you all, particularly for coming along, spending a day with us. Um, certainly welcome our speakers um, for their enthusiastic take-up of the offer to come along and uh, uh, say their piece here um, and to, uh, to come along and share it. One of the things that um, the MSA board uh, was looking to was looking to the future, so it's a rather ironic venue for us to meet, um, but I'm sure you'll see the irony in it. I'm going to talk a little bit of history in a second, as some of you know and probably heard me ad nauseum about some things of ancient times, but... Um, but today really is looking into the future and about where we think manufacturing might be and, and from a Skills Council point of view about what sort of things do we need in terms of uh, shaping up people of today and tomorrow to actually meet that workforce need of whatever the industry could be. Um, the, uh, the, the board was keen about having um, this symposium to sort of help position our future sort of strategies and where we go. But look, in, in terms of change around industry, it just goes on and on forever. Um, it's a constant that happens and um, not just around manufacturing. Some of you might remember that the, uh, there was the Australian wool industry collapse in the early 90s when the price of wool almost halved overnight. So between January 88 and February 1991, the wool industry self-destructed like a blazing comet um, when the price of wool almost halved and the losses were staggering. There was some 12 billion wiped off in that, which is about 20 billion in today's terms. And this is from Charles Massey, uh, who's a, uh, both a farmer and author, writing in The Australian back in 2011. But he authored a book called Breaking the Sheep's Back, where he told the story about the collapse of the wool industry. And the wool industry today, remember Australia, you know, rode on the sheep's back and so on. You probably heard that when we were kids. But it's around about a third of what it was in 1990. Around about one third. So it's a lot smaller than it was. It means that constant change will be with us and change is a, a continuing um, activity. So whatever the economy is driven by today will be different tomorrow and the day after that. Manufacturing is about transforming materials into product from simple transformation to elaborate. And a good example of elaborate transformation is motor vehicles. They're a, the, probably the epitome of, um, of common product where we see significant transformation of materials. Um, sorry. There we go. Harley Tarrant. Some of you might have heard of him, but he built cars in Australia. He's the first manufacturer of petrol-powered motor cars. We had steam-powered vehicles before that, but Harley set up in South Melbourne and eventually moved to premises in Exhibition Street, just down the road down here. But he built 16 cars during that period there, and as you can see in the words, that um, he found that he um, entrepreneurial, but he took up the uh, dealership for Ford motor vehicles over here, and he found that Australian production, his production, couldn't compete with imported cars. So this is in 1907. Does that resonate with you? You know something about that? Harley, uh, by the way, was a key light in setting up things like the uh, Royal Automobile Club of Victoria and places like that. And he died in 1949, but um, he was one of our pioneers. If we look back at other pioneering icons there, the 1948 Holden, Australia's own post-war boom, etc. And look at the price of the car. Um, it uh, it had a you know, significant price at the time, £733. 
and uh, that equated to around about 92 weeks of average weekly earnings, which are around about um, eight pounds per week. There are varying figures on it, so it's not dead accurate. But the 2014 Commodore uh, International cost 36, nearly $37,000. You only need to work 26 weeks at average weekly earnings to buy one of those. So the cost of consumer goods has declined considerably, yet we still continue to want to be able to compete on that sort of market. If we look at the world uh, market, you can't read the numbers there, but I just put it up there so to impress you. But that's a table so showing um, the top uh, the car manufacturing um, nations of the world, um, where world car production in 2011 was over 60, 60 and a quarter million cars per annum, a significant number. And Australia ranked 29th in that table there where we produced just 189, 190,000 cars or 0.3%. China produced uh, 14 and a half million cars, a quarter of the world's total in that time. And Australia produced that 190 odd thousand. So in the scale of things, you can see where we fit in some of these um, activities. In terms of employment and contribution to GDP, um, employment in Australia has risen with our population that's slowly growing and the GDP uh, continues to, uh, to rise with that. In terms of manufacturing, it's been a reasonably stable workforce, gradually declining and the same with its contribution to GDP. If we then have a look at um, where uh, the total employment in manufacturing and uh, where that sits again, we've got a slow decline occurring in manufacturing and our GDP contribution is increasing gently. So even though we've had dramatic growth in our economy and our population and so on, and, and the, obviously the economic activity and gross domestic product, in terms of manufacturing, it's remained fairly stable. But you can see the figures there in 1910, 13% um, of Australia's gross domestic product and 21% of the workforce are involved in manufacturing. 1960, the figure there, it's about the boom peak point of um, we're nearly 30% of our GDP, 29% and 28% of the workforce. And now, as you know, we see declining figures. We're around about 6.8%, 7% of GDP and around about 8% of the workforce. So the expected transition that will, sorry, the trajectory that we'll move on will have probably a, a reasonably stable GDP and but a declining workforce, which means we're using technology better and we're using um, productivity skills in terms of not just the sweat of our brows and the strength of our arms, but other smarter means, means of manufacturing. So today's event is really about what about the future, where's it going to take us, uh, what will it bring? What do we need in terms of a workforce that can deliver um, a viable and sustainable manufacturing? So welcome again, thanks for coming, and uh, back to you Carl, and uh, we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you.